So thank you for being with us today. We're delighted to have Professor Mark Pauli with us for this CIS Get to Know Your Neighbor seminar. Mark is full professor here at EPFL at the Geometric Computing Laboratory. His talk is entitled Towards Intelligent Material Systems. As always, the speaker will be within 40 to 45 minutes for his talk. And then we have ample of time for Q&A. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and you will have the opportunity to unmute yourself and ask them directly to Mark in the end. For the definite presentation, many thanks, Mark, for having accepted to speak. And many thanks to the team for once again organizing the seminar. Mark, the screen is all yours. Thanks, Jan. Um, very happy to be here. Unfortunately, not in person, but I guess everybody's used to this by now. Um, I want to give you a high-level overview of uh, the work in our laboratory, um, focus on some of the main topics of research that we cover, uh, in particular, show you our core methodology. And I'll, I'll showcase a number of different projects, um, which will hopefully give you an idea of what we do and how it might connect to your own research. So hopefully this is the beginning of a dialogue uh, that we can have together. Um, these are, this is the current composition of the lab. These are the people you really should be talking to. Um, I have a quite varied team, PhD students in computer science, of course, but also architects, civil engineering, fabrication experts. And today I will talk about also the work of some former members who've just recently joined faculty positions in the US. So ultimately our research aims at empowering creatives. So we develop computational design methodologies specifically tailored um, towards advanced material systems and digital fabrication technology. And geometry is really at the core of our work. Um, we invent new methods to analyze, create, and optimize complex geometric forms. Um, we do this by developing efficient simulation and optimization algorithms for effective design exploration. And these methods are specifically tailored to respect the constraints imposed by materials and also modern fabrication processes. So I wanna walk you through a very basic example um, to set a bit the stage in the context for our work. Now imagine you wanna throw a ball. Um, this is a well understood physical system. We can simulate um, based on sort of the initial conditions where this band, a ball will land or how it will fly. And now imagine you have a specific performance objective. You want to reach a certain point on, on the floor. You have various choices you can make. For example, you can throw the ball at various levels of force uh, until you might hit the point. Or you could maybe vary the angle at which you throw the ball, and that will also lead to different um, outcomes of this experiment. So in some sense, these two parameters, and there's probably others, define a space in which you can design a system. Um, and each of those points in that design space can then be mapped to an actual outcome through a simulation process. Um, and what you in the end care about is how well you reach your target objective. So in some sense, you have a performance space where you can measure the quality of your design, the performance, so to speak. And in this very basic example, this is just the distance to the target that you're trying to reach. Okay, so this specific example, the specific design, if you will, is not particularly performant. Um, and for a simple example like this, you can probably exhaustively sample your design space to come up with a sort of global picture of how all possible designs behave. But in practice, this can be tricky because the simulation might be complex. Um, for example, if we would integrate turbulent wind fields, for example, we would have to solve complex partial differential equations. Our goal is to um, invert this process of forward sampling and come up with inverse design solutions where you specify, in some sense, you model in performance space. You say, this is the target I want to reach. Now find me the optimal design parameters through an optimization process such that I get the optimal or potentially uh, various optimal solutions. So the design space is typically given by some set of parameters. And I will show you a number of examples where this sort of abstract representation becomes a bit more clear. And we're given some forward process. This can be a physical simulation, uh, some geometric transformation that maps the design into a space where we can measure its performance. So we have some metric that tells us when a design is good. Uh, and this could, of course, be also very subjective measures um, that a designer has. And our goal is that instead of exploring this forward simulation process, which could be very tedious and slow, to come up with inverse design solutions. 
Um, and the challenge here is really that contrary to the simple example that I just showed you, we're typically dealing with thousands, potentially millions of parameters that we have to optimize over. The forward simulation can be quite complex, um, differential or integral equations. The performance metric typically has global dependencies. So if I change my, my target, my goal a little bit, it might have complex global dependencies on the design parameters. So this really puts a lot of pressure onto these inverse design optimizations. If the forward simulation is already hard, how can you hope to invert this process? So we need to carefully design numerical methods that can deal with this complexity. But key to our work is really to work with suitable geometric abstractions, simplifications of the process that allow us to tackle this very difficult general setup of computation. So in some sense, at the core of our work is really handling complexity. How can we deal with um, such difficult design optimization problems if we're faced with um, you know, a large design space, complex forward simulation processes and um, difficult performance metrics. So today I'll walk you through um, a few different projects focusing on one specific area of research and that is on deployable structures. And I will focus on the sort of common themes that link these projects and give you sort of a taste of how we work and um, you know, how we try to come up with um, computational solutions for some challenging problems. So let's look at deployable structures. These are uh, systems that uh, can transform from one state to another. Um, typically they are fabricated in one state and then maybe actuated in various ways. Uh, here you see a few examples from very different domains. Um, what is common to these examples that, well, in this case, the shapes are actually rather simple um, and it's quite difficult to design such structures um, because you want to, predict accurately their behavior under a certain deployment process. So for, our, for the examples I wanna focus on today, I'm gonna to look at um, deployable structures where the material system is fabricated in a specific state and then actuated or deployed into a target state. And what we really care about as a designer is to specify this target state. So this is our input. We wanna make sure the structure deploys to the state and we wanna figure out how would we have to make it? What is the compact fabrication state. In particular, I will focus on examples where we can fabricate in a 2D state and then deploy to a complex curved 3D surface. So this is a typical inverse design problem. And there's many different ways in which um, such structures could be actuated. Uh, not just the mechanical systems I showed you earlier, but things could transform through light, chemical interactions, heat, swelling. There's many, many different ways in which this deployment could happen. So, from a design point of view, what we care about is specifying interesting target states. And these can be quite complex, um, but this complexity should not be represented in the fabrication state. We want to be able to produce these systems um, in a way that is as simple as possible. And in order to facilitate such a design process, we really need very accurate and robust um, simulation methods that can predict how the system will transform from the fabrication state into the target state. So this transformation of uh, a geometric material system needs to be modeled. And then we need to be able in our optimization process to invert um, such a process. So I'll start with a simple example. Um, this project was inspired by these little design objects that you see here, um, which have very interesting characteristics. This is just a sheet of copper or brass material um, with a few incisions made that allow the material to deform. And in fact, this structure behaves like a, a very interesting material class, the so-called aesthetics materials. And these are materials that um, have peculiar behavior that if you stretch them in one direction, they also expand in the other direction. Um, so they have negative Poisson ratio, which is quite unusual. So here's an example. You can see in this video, um, how this material behaves as it's stretched out in one direction, it expands in the other. And that in particular allows us to um, take this normally inextensible material and apply it to more curved surfaces like you see here on the sphere. So the um, principal behavior of this material is actually one of a triangular linkage. So you can imagine that you see this sort of expansion that goes in all directions simultaneously. And now the question that we want to answer is how can we create complex three-dimensional forms out of such a material system? 
So we're in this um, setup of inverse design because what we care about is to approximate a given target surface. So in some sense, our performance space tells us how close, or our performance metric tells us, how close does my material system approximate a given design input? Is it even possible to design a given design input? So we want to minimize this function, but the design space is actually just the planar flat material that we can fabricate. The forward simulation um, calculates how this material would deform. And our goal of, is of course, to invert this process um, to be able as a designer to just specify the target surface directly. So this type of inverse uh, optimization, as I mentioned before, is quite challenging. How do we approach this in general? So in this example, the objective function is actually a, a continuous function in the coordinates of the material space. So if we want to minimize this, we need to um, look at what conditions need to be satisfied in order for a minimum to be reached. So first order necessary condition is just that the gradient is zero. So this is what you do in a standard optimization process. Very common thing you look at in machine learning as well. So you can design a very basic and simple gradient descent method. So this will just take a starting point and try to reduce um, the objective function by moving into the direction of the negative gradient. This is what it looks graphically on a sort of 2D um, landscape. You start at a certain point. Sorry, was there a question? Okay, no. Oui, bonjour, uh, monsieur. Bonjour. Oui, ça va bien, merci. Sorry, there's a question, or somebody forgot to mute their microphone. They forgot to mute themselves, so I okay. just mute them. Sorry about no that. No worries. <laughs> okay, so on this picture on the right, you see how standard gradient descent sort of works. You start at a certain point and you try to um, improve the objective function by moving in this space. The problem, of course, is not so simple as depicted here in this illustration because we're dealing with a, a very, very high dimensional space and a complex objective function. If we would do just standard gradient descent, what would happen is something like this. So here we try to approximate this um, scan of a bust of Max Planck and gradient descent will completely fail. This means that it gets stuck in some local minimum and that's a very common observation that you have if you sort of try to naively um, you know, do gradient descent. This doesn't work. And this is a challenging problem because we don't have that much more information here that we could use um, to initialize this problem. So our approach in such a scenario is to look more closely at the geometry of the problem. And if we go back at looking how these object, uh, oxetics material behave, we observe that they have a very unique property and that is they expand isotropically. And this is something that is reminiscent of uh, a mathematical construction uh, and that of a so-called conformal map. A conformal map is in some sense a continuous uh, generalization of this isotropic expansion. It basically means that we can represent a certain class of deformations uh, through a continuous map that only allows local rotations and scaling. Uh, here's another example that shows how we can map from a planar domain onto a 3D surface, keeping this conformality in place. And this abstraction gives us access to a number of things. First of all, there's a rich theory, um, in particular, a theory that links this expansion factor that we can control locally to the curvature of the surface. The specifics of this equation are not so important. It's more important that um, through this abstraction, we can understand how the curvature of a surface, here the Gaussian curvature illustrated in these sketches, um, behaves as a function of the local expansion of the material. And this allows us to do certain theoretical or answer th certain theoretical questions. For example, if we want to approximate a sphere based on this theory, we can prove that with the material bounds that are imposed by this specific triangular linkage structure, we can at most hope to approximate a half sphere. So you should not try to do more because it's not possible and you can prove this. But probably more important, this theoretical or, or, or this abstraction of the geometry gives us access to very powerful computational methods that have been developed in computer graphics. So we have um, very effective tools to compute such a conformal map for any 3D object. Uh, and the uniformization theorem tells us such a conformal map always exists. And this allows us to actually now tackle this very difficult optimization problem 
through this detour of computing a conformal mapping, um, as I described just now. So if you look at this inverse design challenge that we set out with, instead of just doing sort of blind gradient descent, we first look at this specific geometric abstraction, starting from some input design, um, we first compute a conformal map and then use that to initialize our continuous gradient-based optimization. Uh, and this is actually what makes this uh, optimization tractable. I'm not gonna go into the details of the, ob of the objective, uh, objective functions. We basically want to approximate a given target as good as possible. Um, there are some uh, abstractions of the material in terms of rigidity, and we need to avoid collisions. But basically the conformal map here, this intermediate stage that we inject into the optimization is absolutely key to make this work. And with that, we can actually solve the problem of taking some input model, mapping it into the plane, where we can then cut out the material and deform that material into this target shape. So here you see an example of it here. Normally I would be able to show this to you, you know, in person and you could touch it today, unfortunately not. The question remains though, how can you deploy such a structure? And in this case, we actually deploy it sort of manually. We deform the surface with the aid of, of a mold surface. Here's another example where you see this. So this is actually not really a deployable structure yet because this material um, does not actually carry any information about the shape that we want to deploy into. It's a generic um, 2D material and it requires sort of an external guiding scaffold in order to get towards the target shape. Uh, so this leads to a complex deployment process and is not very practical if you want to actually go, you know, more automatically towards your desired target shape. So the goal is now to, in some sense, bring a bit of intelligence into this material um, and use a sort of process that we call programming. So the idea would be that the material itself knows what target shape it should deploy into. So how can we do this? The structure I've just showed you achieves curvature by um, opening up in this non-uniform way. So you see for some parts of this half sphere, um, these little triangles have created a big hole and for others, a very small one. And that basically means that um, there is no information about this shape embedded in the structure itself. We can change the material system, however, in such a way that um, the material itself knows what shape it wants to go into. How can we do this? Well, here we identified a unique state of the structure, and that is when the material is fully expanded everywhere. So what you see on the right is now the triangles are all different, but the openings are all the same. They're all fully open hexagons. Uh, so this means that if we stretch our material as much as we can, until it cannot stretch any further, we will have automatically achieved the desired target state. And that means, of course, that the material in its fabrication state is now different. It, it actually is tailored towards this specific, in this case, very simple shape of a half sphere. And it has various um, sort of expansions already coded in. There's small triangles with big openings and large triangles with small openings. But if you apply a deployment process such as inflation or even gravity under certain uh, circumstances, you can automatically go from the two-dimensional, the flat state into the desired target surface. Incidentally, but this is something we only discovered afterwards, um, these structures do exist in nature in a very similar form. So this is an old, from an old book from the early 20th century where um, natural shapes exploit sort of the same principles. So one mode of actuation that we are, were interested in was inflation. So we ask ourselves, how can we inflate such structures automatically? And for that, we need to understand and model the inflation process a bit more. Now, if you think about a balloon, um, one thing that, is, that becomes clear is not every shape can actually be generated by a balloon. For example, this shape here, if you pressurize it, um, would actually turn into this structure. Um, again, geometry comes to our aid because we can, uh, we can study um, the conditions of um, inflatability, if you will. And in specifically, in terms of curvature, we can see that we cannot have these inward bumps because a pressure force at the interior will always push this outwards. We can classify this based on mean curvature, 
Um, and then with a bit more analysis, we can actually prove which class of surfaces can be inflated with such a material system. So again, I don't go into the details here, but the key message is that with a sort of geometric abstraction of the process underlying this transformation, we can understand a lot more about the design space, about the, the space of feasible um, geometric instantiation of such a system. And it gives us also tools that if we have surfaces that we know we cannot achieve, to modify them locally in a way that um, keeps the design intent as much as possible. You see an example where the surface on the left cannot be realized, but with small modifications, we can get to a, a state that is achievable. Uh, and here's another example of this. So the computational pipeline is actually fairly similar. Again, the conformal map um, that we introduced earlier does the bulk of the work. So we take our input design and we flatten it into the plane um, with a conformal approach. And now we have to optimize jointly for the 2D material space and the three-dimensional deployed surface. Um, but these are fairly standard optimization techniques that do not require um, a lot of special treatment given that we have already a good initial solution computed from the conformal map. And then we can solve problems like this where given a design input on the, on the left, we can compute the 2D material structure that you see here on the bottom left that deploys into the desired target shape. So for this, we created a, a simple scaffold and a generic balloon. So this balloon inflates, but it doesn't know anything about the target shape. It's just there to actuate. So if we put the actual material on top of that balloon, uh, now we can deploy towards this programmed target shape. So that's a very easy way to automatically deploy this 2D planar material system into a complex 3D shape. Here's another example where we use gravity. Again, we need a deployment force that expands the material. So here, if we have a structure that is hanging down like this, we can fabricate the flat uh, material model and then deploy it simply by, um, by gravity. So this is extremely simple and very robust, of course. So with these programmed materials, we have now adapted the material structure automatically towards the target surface that we want to create. So there has been some sort of static programming going on. The material knows which state it wants to go into. Um, but there's a small drawback, and that is that the um, target shape actually requires that these deployment forces are active. If I have this balloon model and I take out the air, or, uh, then it will collapse back to its initial state. Why is that? Because these tri triangular oxidic linkages are actually elastic materials. So they expand um, as we've shown before, but when you let go, they go back to their original state. Now there's an intriguing concept called bistability, where you can manipulate the geometry of these cells such that they actually um, achieve a second stable equilibrium state. Um, so here you see a, a simulation experiment that gives an indication of how this works. Um, as the surface expands, it reaches a second equilibrium state that is separated by an energy barrier, which means that um, as you move beyond that point P3, the surface will actually settle into a second stable state. And here you see a physical experiment that illustrates this behavior. Um, you can see that we can design different cells with different expansion factors that keep actually the, the second expanded state in a stable configuration. And this allows us to um, now extend our design pipeline again, starting from the input surface, classical inverse design. This is what we're trying to achieve. We want to figure out what the design variables are, we use our conformal map. Um, we can adapt and select appropriate scale factors there's some additional optimization going on to make these cells as stiff as possible. Um, and then we can lay out the 2D material frame. So what's different in this example compared to the others is that the surface you see on the top right is now stable independent of any actuation force. In fact, once you deploy it, and I'll show you a, a sort of deployment right now, you can actuate it just by injecting a bit of force. And then the material automatically deploys and stays stably in that state. So these oxidic materials actually offer a number of interesting potential applications. Uh, we collaborated with some designers who came up with a few ideas, um, some of them quite speculative, 
uh, including a potential Mars habitat. Not sure if we're going to get there. But one of the examples I want to highlight, and that is this idea of a curved heart stent. So heart stents are deployable structures that you know are inserted um, into a problematic area of, of an artery um, and expanded with a balloon there. And typically, what happens is these structures are straight cylinders, um, but in practice, it is actually quite beneficial to have something that is adapted to a specific patient's geometry. In particular, using curved heart stents for regions where um, you know, the natural shape of, of uh, the artery is actually curved. So with this kind of approach, you can potentially build a personalized uh, stent mechanism where you scan uh, the problematic area and design um, with this specific target geometry in mind, a deployable structure that has that property. So hopefully these kind of things will, will find their way into application. Um, but because we're impatient, we didn't wait for you know, clinical studies, we did something else. Uh, here's an example of an oxetic that you will hopefully soon see on campus. You might have already seen a construction site that has been dormant for quite a while now. There's been quite a bit of delays, but eventually the goal is to build uh, an oxetic um, deployable pavilion uh, where the current polygrill is, and hopefully that will be completed in the spring uh, next year. Okay, that was one specific system. Um, now I wanna show you a different example um, with actually a kind of similar approach to solve the problem. So here we look at different kind of inflatable structures that is created by fusing two um, sheets of material along certain curves. And if these curves are straight, it deploys into a sort of standard flat shape. But interestingly, once these curves are not straight anymore, something surprising happens and the structure deploys into a double curved shape out of plane. So how can we simulate and understand such system and design with them? Again, we make use of a geometric abstraction. Simulating these inflatable structures in itself is quite challenging, um, but optimizing them is, is even harder. So we need to first understand how such a material system behaves. And in particular here, we use the geometric abstraction that shows that you know, as you inflate these tubes, what happens is that they contract uh, transversely because the air pressure pushes them into the vertical directions. And that means they have to contract uh, transversely, but they do not really change in length along these channels, okay? So this means that we have a specific contraction in a certain direction um, within certain bounds. And once we move from a straight to a curved configuration, this actually forces the structure to buckle out of plane. And to understand this kind of buckling behavior is exactly what we're trying to do uh, with our system. Geometrically, what this means is that we actually change the surface metric on that flat sheet. And the surface or the material system tries to assume a state of lowest energy. And it does that by transforming into a three-dimensional shape. So we can abstract this behavior geometrically by looking at, again, similar to the conformal map analysis, a mapping from 2D to 3D. Here, it looks a bit more complicated, um, but essentially what this uh, weird looking equation says is that exactly what I described earlier, in one direction, the material doesn't contract, and in the other direction, it does by a certain factor. So we can take this abstraction and now find a mapping from the plane to 3D. But of course, for our design approach, we need to go the other way around. We want to start with a given target surface and invert such a function to find the 2D layout that we can then fabricate. And this time, this is not a sort of standard um, parameterization that we, we already know. We have to custom design our own objective function and build our own solver that can handle this. Um, this is a relatively complicated looking function that combines various different terms, geometric terms, also some physical terms to really capture the behavior as well as possible. But importantly, we can solve these type of objective functions robustly. And that means we can follow the same sort of inverse design pipeline, starting from a design surface. We can flatten the surface into the 2D domain um, where we can then extract the layout of these air channels that we need, the fusing curves where we fuse material together such that they inflate to the desired target. So then we build a discretization mesh on top of this and simulate um, the inflation. 
Critically, and this is common for most of the inverse design um, problems that we look at, in this optimization pipeline, the forward simulation is embedded in an inner loop. So we need to be able to accurately simulate the inflation process in order to then run optimization on the inflated equilibrium shape. So this is very important that as our optimization runs, we constantly have to recompute and update um, the inflation process so that we, we can find the 2D layout of our target shape. And once we've done this, we can fabricate. So here we, in this case, build our own little um, 2D plotter, if you will, that fuses these two sheets of material together simply by a laser that creates enough heat to, to push them together. And then you can cut them out and deploy them. So here you see a few examples that we fabricate. And again, the point is that fabrication is trivial, right? This is just a 2D system that um, you can build basically from standard components. These films are extremely thin, but they deploy to complex 3D shapes that are actually very strong and stiff. And we validated you know, sort of the accuracy of the system uh, with a few scans. And currently we're in the process of exploring applications similar to what I mentioned earlier, for example, we're looking at personalized medical braces that you can inflate instead of using a cast, you have an inflatable system. You can think of many other products where the target shape, for example, is adapted to um, a specific human body. You know, think inflatable bike helmets or things like that. Okay, so this is a, another system that allows us to um, build complex three-dimensional objects with a very basic and simple 2D fabrication setup by exploiting the fact that we can you know, simulate and forward deploy these structures. Okay, the last example I wanna show you is um, deployable grid shells. So these are um, systems that traditionally exist in, in engineering and architecture in particular, where you have a scissor linkage system that you can expand and then deform into various structures. Why is that useful? For example, because you can build things um, in a very effective way by assembling the structure on the ground and then deploying it, for example, here with cranes into the curved target shape that you acquire. These structures are, are very um, efficient in terms of material use and structural stability, but they're very hard to design and they're difficult to deploy. So what we studied here is um, how can we uh, exploit that system, but build a structure that can be deployed much more easily. And the basic idea is to take that regular linkage structure and vary the spacings between joints. Um, this again creates an incompatibility in this expansion and forces the structure to buckle into 3D. So again, um, conceptually this behaves still like a single degree of freedom linkage, but because of mechanical incompatibility allows us to deploy the structure automatically into 3D. Now, this is a relatively complex system. So we need to be able to simulate um, such a structure accurately. Uh, in particular, each of these individual beams can bend, stretch, or, or twist. And we need models that can actually accurately capture this behavior. So here you see an example of the deployment. Um, this is a structure that is flat in this state. And then as we actuate it um, using torque actuators, it first expands, but then at some point, this mechanical incompatibility kicks in and the structure has to buckle out of place. Now, the challenge is that designing such structures is extremely complex because if you build such a 2D layout, it's very hard to understand um, how the deployment process works and in particular to avoid um, very high stress concentrations in this, um, in this deployed state because you're literally exploiting the fact that incompatibilities lead to buckling, which is very difficult to model and predict. So here we have to build a, a more complex optimization framework. Um, in this case, we care about two states. We want to make sure the structure deploys to the desired target, but we also want to make sure the undeployed, the fabrication state um, stays planar and is of low energy. So this requires us to minimize an objective that minimizes the elastic energy of the deployed state minimizes the elastic energy of the target state and links them together so that they can actually transform from one to the other. And there's additional constraints that we have to satisfy. So this gives us a very um, challenging 
optimization because in each step of the inner loop, we have to solve already very complex nonlinear optimization problems. And in this case, um, any black box or standard solver will not do anything useful. So we had to really build and design our own custom, um, custom solver for this, which is quite challenging. So particularly here, we built um, a Newton method and I'm not gonna go into detail. I'll just show you that this is not trivial. Um, this is a document that just shows the derivatives that Julian had to compute in order to build this optimization. So not simple, um, quite advanced um, optimization here, but it's really worth it because it makes all the difference. If you run the design optimization and here you see a little video of that, the point is here that you almost see no change happening. Oh, the sun is coming up, nice. Um, so there's no change happening almost in the design, but the structural performance is, is completely different. So from a system that would be completely uh, impossible to actuate because of very high stress concentrations, we get to a solution that actually works in practice and we can deploy from a planar state. Here are some examples. So you see um, how these X shells um, can be actuated here. We just pull them apart by uh, with a bunch of ropes, but they know which state they want to go into. So we don't have to do much. These structures automatically deploy into the desired target state. And you can see that our prediction uh, on the top is, is quite accurate in terms of the physical model. We also use this technique to build something a bit larger. This was a, a competition we actually won at the Form and Force exhibition in Barcelona with our little pavilion that you can just flat assemble and then pull out in one go into its desired shape. Um, how are we doing on time? Yeah, maybe I'll skip the weaving. Let's skip this. So I wanna to come to one important point and for that show you um, very briefly another um, project that we've worked on. So far what I've shown you are inverse design problems where we've created a material system to deploy from a flat state into some desired target state. And the optimization basically gives you the fabrication instructions so you can build the system and you know, if the prediction is accurate enough, it will behave as it, uh, as it should. But of course, what is happening is that once you've created the system, um, the, the program state is static. We cannot change the design. If we wanted a different design, we have to fabricate a different model. So I wanna end with just uh, promoting this idea of a truly programmable material system. And for that, I wanna just give you a quick uh, insight into a recent paper we did with um, Pedro Rice um, of the Flax Lab at EPFL, where we studied reprogrammable materials. So the system I've showed you so far can be understood in some sense as mechanical metamaterials. Um, they are specifically designed um, geometric materials that behave in a specific way. Now there's a huge field of metamaterial design where you create a geometric structure that, for example, has a specific um, displacement or force displacement relationship. And by changing the geometric composition of the material, you get different behaviors. You get stiffer or weaker materials or that behave in different ways. Again, if you fabricate the material, it has a static um, behavior. The idea that we wanted to explore is whether we can design a mechanical metamaterial whose physical behavior can be changed after the fact. So basically we wanna say, can we program this material on the fly? And this is gonna be analogous to what you do on a hard drive. Uh, specifically, we use um, mechanic, uh, sort of, uh, sorry, magnetic actuation to change the inter internal structure of the material, similar to how you would write uh, using a magnetic field, um, old school hard drive. And for this, we designed what we call a mechanical bit. This is a mechanical system that has two distinct states and these states can be changed through the use of a magnetic field. Now, importantly, these states remain um, fixed after the magnetic field has been turned off. So we can truly switch the behavior of these, of these cells. We can program them and basically can distinguish between an on, what we call an on and an off state. And this is realized again with this principle of bi-stability. The, the purple structure that you see here 
is a bistable cell that can um, you know, retain a stable equilibrium at two different configurations. And here you see how um, we can switch between these two states. So you see when the electric field is um, actuated in one way, it's the cell switches from one to the other. Now, why is this interesting? Because it allows us to actually change the stiffness of the cell. So here you see a typical um, force displacement curve um, for one of the states. And if we go to the other state, here you see that the bistable cell is in the lower configuration. If we go to the other state, then the force displacement curve is completely different. So we have the same mechanical element, but the mechanical behavior has changed depending on which state we've programmed the system to be in. And you can then combine multiple of these cells and individually program them and thereby have a wide variety of mechanical behavior. So this is now a mechanical system. And importantly, the difference in behavior does not depend on any you know, electric current that is being applied at the time. We can reconfigure this material um, and then achieve a stable state in which the specific behavior that we care about um, is achieved. And now, if I go back to what I talked to you earlier, these systems that I showed you um, are sort of programmed materials, but they're not necessarily intelligent materials yet. For us, the objective was, you know, we want to make sure we have a simple fabrication process, we can automatically deploy, we have uh, high structural performance, and we accurately achieve a desired target state. The question now is what could programmability bring here? For example, could we do multiple target shapes? Could we reconfigure our material to deploy into different target shapes? Could we have a sort of reactive deployment where depending on environmental conditions, for example, the structure deploys differently? Could we have controllable force transfer? For example, we could build, I don't know, a robotic gripper or something. Could we in general design complex motion paths? And in some sense, the idea would be to bring programmability into these material systems, somewhat approaching, if you will, um, yeah, almost robotics, but without introducing necessarily complex sensing and control infrastructure. So the idea is really to um, utilize geometry and the material itself as much as possible um, to be able to design systems with more advanced functionality. So this is, I think, the, the, the challenge that we're working towards right now. Um, and I think there is sort of a sweet spot where you can find um, you know, a sufficient level of complexity in terms of additional sensing and control, but really push as much as possible the intelligence of the system into the material itself. Okay, that was a rapid fire overview, I guess. Uh, if you want to learn more, here are a bunch of references that you can look at. You can find them on our webpage. Um, I want to make one last point is that we also try as much as possible to release code and demos and make this research accessible to as many people as possible. Um, so hopefully um, some of these things will be useful for you. And I would be specifically interested if you have challenging inverse problems, um, you know, where geometry is key. Um, where you know this, the behavior of the system is largely dictated by the geometric structure of its components, um, and you are faced with challenging inverse problems that you might have no solution for at the moment, uh, I'd be happy to discuss more and, and see if some of the methods that we use and have developed could be applicable maybe for solving some of the problems that you are facing. Thank you very much. And thanks, Mark. Do we have any questions in the audience? Then uh, maybe uh, let me set some work for closing for a few minutes. Many thanks, Mark, again for the presentation today. Thanks to all of you who have been with us. Um, just a brief heads up. So next week, same time as always. So quarter past three. We're looking forward to welcome Professor Susan Murphy of Harvard University for a CS colloquium. The week after. The week before Christmas, 20th of December, we're looking forward to talk with a colleague, Matteo Dal Peraro from Life Sciences, who will speak about his activities and his work. Thank you very much, and looking forward to seeing you soon again. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.